Merry Christmas. What a beautiful day to celebrate God's birth as in the form of Jesus. I'd like to uh, inform you that we will not have any words up here. Frank is down in his back and that's an unfortunate thing. So uh, I'll ask you to get your hymn books out and I'll announce the number. We'll start off praising God in song with hymn number 96, Good Christian Men Rejoice.
forever. If we didn't turn off the music, you guys would be still, you still are. I learned that from Ms. Abbott, which was my ninth grade algebra teacher. You don't say anything till everybody's quiet. We never learned much algebra in that class. <laughs> Let's go to the Lord in prayer on this Christmas morning. Gracious God, we thank you for the fact that you sent your son and we can celebrate that. And it is truly a celebration. We thank you for the opportunities that knowing your son has brought into our lives. We thank you that we have got the opportunity to uh, share him with those around us. And Lord, we ask that you'd help us to do that, especially at this time of the year. Father, there are many that are in the uh, hospitals and that are infirmed and aren't able to make it here on Sunday. We ask that you would help us to uh, share some of your blessings with, that we have with them as we talk to them and call them and give them encouragement during this this Christmas season. Lord, once again, we thank you for family. We thank you for friends. We thank you for the opportunity, once again, to serve you. We thank you for all the many blessings that you've given us. You've blessed us beyond our greatest imagination. And so, Lord, we say thank you for that. Now, Lord, we thank you for the, the rain that you've given us. We thank you for our friends. We thank you for our church. But most of all, Father, we thank you for your son, who we celebrate coming today on this Christmas day as he came to be a man and we ask that you would help us to uh, to focus on that throughout the next week and actually throughout the year year long we now thank you for these things it's in your son's name that we pray amen don't trip we'll continue praising God in song with infant holy infant lowly hymn number 106 
star of wonder, star of night, star with royal beauty bright, westward leading still proceed, guide us to thy perfect celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ. When we lit the first candle, we asked God to come and be our good shepherd. God's shepherd has come in Jesus Christ. When we lit the second candle, we asked God to come and forgive our sins. God has come in Jesus Christ to take away our sins and die upon the cross that we might be forgiven. When we lit the third candle, we felt joyful, even in our longing for Christ to come. Christ, who has been born in a manger, will come again in glory to wipe away every tear from our eyes. When we lit the fourth candle, we remembered that Christ would come as a son, the son of Mary, the son of David, the son of God. The son has been born. He is Emmanuel, God with us. Today we celebrate the birth of Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Good Shepherd, Jesus who forgives our sins, Jesus who will come again, Jesus the Son of Mary, the Son of David, and the very Son of God. We light this candle with great joy and celebration because Christ is born in Bethlehem. God's Son has come into the world to be our Savior, and He will come again in glory. God promises through the prophet Micah that His future rule will come from Bethlehem, even though this town is indeed a little town and really quite insignificant. This is from Micah 5, 2 through 5. But you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Then in Psalms 145, a psalm of praise of David. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. Would you please stand as we sing our offertory hymn, He is Born. Oh 
Over the skies of Bethlehem appeared a star While angels sang to lowly shepherds Three wise men seeking truth traveled from afar Hoping to find the child of heaven Falling on their knees they bowed before the humble Prince of Peace, I bring an offering of worship to my King. No one on earth deserves the praises that I sing. Jesus, may you receive the honor that you're due. Oh Lord, I bring an offering to you. I bring an offering to you. The sun cannot compare to the glory of your love. There is no shadow in your presence. No mortal man would dare to stand before your throne. Before the Holy One of Heaven It's only by your blood And it's only through your mercy Lord, I come I bring an offering of worship to my King No one on earth deserves the praises that I sing Jesus, may you receive the honor that you're due. Oh, Lord, I bring an offering to you. I bring an offering of worship to my King. No one on earth deserves the praises that I sing. Jesus, may you receive the honor that you're due. Oh, Lord, I bring an offering to you. Oh, Lord, I bring an offering to you. I bring an offering to you.
Well, we're not going to have a children's sermon, but I'm going to tell you what the children's sermon was, okay? Because that was the precursor to what I was going to follow on with. But now I've got something else to follow on with. Anyway, we'll go from there. This is a day to adapt, overcome. You see a, a crash up here, a small crash. If you were to look at it, and I was going to ask the children what, if they could tell me who the characters were of the crash, and is there anything missing? And what's missing is there's no manger and no Jesus. And so then we would be looking for the manger and the Jesus, and we would find it right here. And we would talk about the fact that we don't want to forget about Jesus for the remainder of the year. Just because Christmas has come, we don't want to forget about him. So we put him in his place, in his proper place here at the manger between Mary and Joseph. And then as they left, I would give them a little book. And this is not for them. This is a book for their parents to read to them. And the book is, If You're Missing Baby Jesus. And I've got these books here. And if you've got a grandchild or a Most of you don't have too many children still at home. But if you've got a grandchild that you would like to have to read this to, uh, we've got 15 of the books. So if you would like to take one and read it to your grandchild at some point in time later on during the uh, week, or maybe even save it for next year, because it's a good, it's a little good book to, uh, a good little book to, uh, for them. And then the sermon was going to be on Let's see, what did I have for a title? Something like uh, Lost in the Shuffle. And it was about Mary and Joseph when they went to the temple and they were on their way home and they had lost Jesus. They didn't know where he was. And these were all good things and put them all together. Maybe you might have made a pretty good morning, Sunday morning, but I'm going to tone it down a little bit and we're going to look at one other thing, another aspect of Christ's coming. And that is found in 2 Corinthians. I know it's found in 2 Corinthians because I've looked at it here. 2 Corinthians 9.15. So if you turn with me to that, 2 Corinthians 9.15, and we will look at a comment Paul makes about Jesus. 9.15. And Paul says this in eight words, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. For the indescribable gift that God has given us. Why do you think uh, now that all the gifts are open and other things like that, if I were to ask you, what did you get or what was it? You might say, well, I got a new iPhone. Anybody get a new iPhone? Okay, then maybe you'd say, I got a new toaster. Anybody get a new toaster? My wife told me never to give her anything plug in. So toaster wouldn't be good. (laughs) How about a new shirt? I got a new shirt. Okay, I got two new shirts. I got uh, maybe a gift card, maybe something else that you got, but you can pretty much describe to me everything that you got for Christmas. All the things that you gave. If you can't describe it, you either didn't particularly appreciate it or it's just something that you didn't know what it was. You might say, oh, this is lovely. I mean, it's just, a, what is it? Have you ever gotten one of those? I have. <laughs> but it's indescribable. And so Paul uses that word, indescribable, gift for what we've been given in Jesus Christ. What does it mean? What does it mean when he says it's indescribable? Because we fail to describe the gift does not make it indescribable. If, you know, what is this? I don't know what it is. That's not it. What it means is the giver, the giver can always describe it. I have found that no matter what I get or whatever it is, the giver will always be able to tell me what it is. And pretty much what do I need to use it for? I'll never forget one year my son-in-law gave me one of these. Um, I, use, I, I still use a razor blade 
believe it or not, some of you think, well, he doesn't ever shave. But anyway, <laughs> razor blade, <laughs> you don't need one, John. Neither do you, Ted. But anyway, the, the razor blade, I, get, I, I use razor blades and they're in the cartridge. I got a little thing that sharpens those razor blades from my son-in-law one year. Doesn't really work too well, I can tell you that right now. <laughs> but let me just say, the gifts are describable, and, and they, sometimes you can use them, sometimes you can't use them. You go through them. One year, Richard Burton gave Elizabeth Taylor a huge, huge diamond. In fact, I think it was just on sale at, uh, what's the name of that company that sells all these? Sotheby's, 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 something like that. They just put all of her jewels on sale. Actually, what they did is they put them on view to be sold at a later date in auction. But this big diamond, and I don't know how many carats were, it is not just indescribable. People would think, hey, that's a wonderful gift. It cost millions of dollars, but it was not indescribable. It wasn't indescribable because every paper in the world told you what the size was, what the weight was, how many carats it was, how much it cost. All of those things to describe what the purity of it, what the color of it was. All of these things were there to show. So there is no such thing as we look at it today as, as an indescribable gift. Since all human presence, the presence that we give to people, I think are describable, it must be more than a human present that Paul's talking about here. And it is. That's indescribable. Precisely what Paul was thinking about what it was, the context was that they had just given a, a, a gift to the poor in Jerusalem. Uh, Paul changes the subject from this giving here to Christ and his people. And then he talks about the greatest of all possible gifts and describes it as the indescribable gift. Now, I don't want to talk, toy with words or, and, and exaggerate about who's speaking what and all these other things, but there are a couple of things that I, I want to say. People have tried to describe this gift that God has given to us and how they tried to do it. Michelangelo tried to do it in the Sistine Chapel. He was a painter, an artist. He tried to do it. Uh, I've got some other names here that I don't even know who these people are. Raphael, Fra Filippo Lippi, all of these people just tried to describe in painting what this gift was. Musicians have tried. Handel, hallelujah. You know that one. That was the first, that was the first praise song. Same thing over and over and again. Uh, never mind. Okay. Bach, Johann Sebastian Bach tried to describe what it was that this gift was. Poets have tried to do it. Milton tried to do it. Even our own David, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, tried to describe what it was going to be, the Messiah was going to be. All of these are imperfect descriptions. Indescribable. That's the gift. So what is, what is it about this gift that makes it indescribable. And it is a gift. This is a gift-giving season that we're in right now. Christ is a gift that was given to us. What is it about him that is indescribable? Well, first of all, the nature of the gift in itself is indescribable. It's Jesus Christ himself in person. His name says something. Jehovah saves is what Jesus means. Jesus or Josh. In, in many cases, Joshua. Emmanuel, what does that mean? God with us. God saves, God is with us. How about infinite, eternal, unchangeable, self-sufficient? Here's a good one. Tell me if this is a good description. Man and God. Who put those two together? God put those two together. It's very hard for us to, in our minds, to figure out how God can be man. But because of the character of the gift, the per person of Christ, the person of Jesus, we have man and God put together. That in and of itself is indescribable. The church took 300 years to describe it and another 100 years to figure it out and come together on how they were going to do it. It took 400 years to describe how God could become man. Well, that's a little longer than I'm going to live, so I, maybe if I'm trying to figure it out, I'm not going to get there. 
But the point is that that's part of the gift that we've gotten. That's how, what makes it indescribable. The other thing that makes it indescribable is the work of Christ. The person of Christ is one, the work of Christ is another. What he has done for us, his sacrifice, his atonement. You know what atonement means? It means covering. It means the covering that he's done for us. And what was it that was the covering? It was his blood, just as on the day of atonement, the blood of the lamb was put on the mercy seat or the bema or the judgment seat in the temple. Christ's blood is the atonement for our sin. How about propitiation? That's a good word. We use it all the time. What does it mean? I don't necessarily know. Well, yes, I do. It means he is the legal satisfaction. I don't know that you've uh, heard me talk about this before, but the legal satisfaction of the debt that we do, we are due, that we owe. In fact, his last words on the cross were, it is finished. And those, that's one word, the telestai, and that one word was found on, in, in the town of Pompeii, was found on a laundry list. And that one word was on the bottom of that laundry list. And it basically said, paid in full. So this laundry list had been paid. It's like the stamp that you get paid in full on something else. Christ is the propitiation. He was the legal satisfaction of the debt that we owed paid in full and his comment on the cross at the very end was that very thing paid in full his last words the next thing is he is the reconciliation or the reconciler of us what does it mean when we reconcile something if you reconcile your bank account you take your account but you think you've got money and the bank, what they think you've gotten money, and you make yours equal theirs, right? Well, if it doesn't equal, then you go to find out why it doesn't equal. But Christ is the reconciliation for us. He's the one who has made everything even between us and God. There's nothing between us now anymore. We still have a sin nature, and we still sin. And if we say we don't, we're liars, just in case anybody asks. But we still have that sin nature. What he's done is he is the reconciliation for us and God. So you can see his work, his person and his work make the gift indescribable. The other thing that makes it indescribable is the grace by which it was given. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying there? The grace by which it was given it is while we were yet meaning still sinners in other words we were still going on our own way doing our own thing going along in this direction God sent his son he didn't need to he didn't have to it's only because of grace that he did it and if you heard me talk about grace before, you know that I understand grace as being God's riches at Christ's expense. G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. We have the grace of God. Because he wanted to give it to us. Now why would he want to give it to us? Because he loved us. Remember John 3.16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That's it. That's the grace that we've received from him. That's what makes the gift indescribable. That's one of the things. But another thing yet still that not only just the fact that the gift itself has got this nature and the fact that the grace by which we got it is, is important, but also the next thing is the effect that that gift has on us, or has, period, on us particularly. Forgiveness of sins according to the riches of God's grace. We are justified. There's another one of those words, justified. What does that mean? 
To me, justified means just as if I'd never sinned. I'm now okay. Because I'm reconciled, I'm now justified. And in God's eyes, because he's looking at Christ instead of looking at me, it's just as if I have never sinned. And we look at that and we say, oh, well, justification before God's bar of justice. In other words, I'm okay to be there. The other one is forgiveness. Forgiven. My sins have been forgiven. What does that mean? Forgiveness is negative. Do you understand what I just said? It's negative because it looks at the past. Justification is positive in that it looks at the future. So I've been forgiven but I've now been justified and I'm moving in that direction. That's how I look at the gift that God has given to us. Some other things that come out of that, we're adopted into God's family, we're joint heirs with Jesus, we have a gift of the Holy Spirit and have been indwelled permanently with the Holy Spirit. That's something that the old, even the Old Testament saints didn't have. They were indwelled with the Spirit for a while. We have a divine peace. You know, when they say peace on earth, goodwill to men, we're talking the peace is now I'm no longer in, in, in uh, opposition to God. I'm not opposition to God. I am now, I can now have peace by doing His work and by doing His will and accepting His Son. And then finally, the other thing is that I have a place in his realm in heaven. So we look at this gift which God has given us and that we celebrate the coming of at this time of year and we say, God, thank you for this. You have given me a gift. It is an indescribable gift. Something that I cannot, I mean, I can't fathom all that it has done for me. And the other part is, I couldn't, and I don't understand why you would want to do this for me. He didn't do it for you. He did it for me. As I'm looking at it, I have to understand that he did all of these things for me. Because of what he wanted to show me, and that was his love. And in Paul's words, that's what made God's gift to us, which is his son, indescribable. We can try and we can try and we can try, but we can never fully describe it. When we can describe it and we can make that what we think it is, and I want to, this is a whole nother topic. But when we think we can fully understand God and that we've got a handle on him and he quote unquote fits in our little box that we've set up here, we are guilty of idolatry. What? How can I be guilty of idolatry when I'm worshiping God? The God you worship is not the God of creation and the God of the universe. If you look at it that way, you've got to take and think outside of the little box that you've got God in. The Israelites, thought, well, this is another, another time for another time, but the Israelites thought that they could go get God, grab the Ark of the Covenant, take it to where they were having war, and they would go get God and would have God in the box, basically. And what happened? Somebody took their box along with them and they took and they had to suffer for that period of time the issue is we don't want to set God into a box we want him to be indescribable the gift to be indescribable to us and we need to understand that we don't all describe him the same way but we're all talking about the same God as we go through it so my prayer today is that as we think about Christmas and what we've done, what he's done for us, and how we celebrate that, 
that we'll do that in a way that brings honor and glory to him and we respond correctly to the gift that he has given us through his son. For some of us, that may mean that we've got to accept him as our son, as his son and our savior. We have to say, yeah, you know what you said is right. That would be reconciliation. That would be salvation. That would be understanding. I don't understand all I know about that. I still don't all know all I know about that. But I do know that you, God, sent your son, Jesus, for me. And that I needed it because I was not right with you. We call that sin. For others of you, you may be saying, hey, I kind of like this place. I like Park Hill Baptist Church. I'd kind of like to join it, be a part of that family. Because as a family, we all are worshiping that God, and we are all doing, in our understanding, what he wants us to do. And some of you may say, I don't understand propitiation and justification and, and uh, reconciliation and all the other shuns that you talked about. I don't understand these. And you've got questions. I would like to help you answer those questions. I cannot answer the questions for you, but I might be able to help you to understand the answers to those questions. So as we're doing that today, on this Christmas Day, think about how you are going to respond to the indescribable gift which you have received. Gracious God, we do thank you that you love us and that you care for us and that you have provided your son for us. Lord, we don't understand all that. We don't understand why you did it. Well, we know that you say you did it because you loved us and you know that we know that we can feel your love. But Lord, thank you. It wasn't necessary. We weren't looking for it. It's something you did for us completely out of your own love for us. And we say thank you. Now, Lord, as we come to this time of uh, response, we ask that you would work in each one of our hearts, help us to know exactly what to do. And, Father, most of all, we ask that you would help us to demonstrate your love to those around us. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Ted has picked an excellent song for us to sing as the invitation or response, and that is, What Child Is This? How Do I Respond? to this indescribable gift which I have been given. Would you please stand as we sing our invitation hymn. What child is this who lay to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping, whom angels greet with anthems sweet, while shepherds watch are keeping. This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him, Lord, the babe, the son of Mary. Why lies he in such mean estate, where ox and ass are feeding? Good Christian, fear for sinners, hear the silent word is pleading. This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him, Lord, the babe, the son of Mary. So bring him incense, gold, and myrrh, 
her come peasant king to own him the king of kings salvation brings let loving hearts enthrone him this this is christ the king whom shepherds guard and angels sing haste haste to bring him lord the babe the son of mary uh, the reverend is going to be here uh, Sally and I are going to have our Christmas next week with our kids, and Brian O'Callaghan is going to be here. That is correct. For uh, Ted, uh, y'all have met Brian before, I think. Brian O'Callaghan is going to lead the, the singing, and Mark is going to bring the message to you. Mark is a chaplain with uh, hospice, and uh, Reverend Mark Bernard, Bernhard is uh, somebody you need to hear. I think you'll look forward to that. Uh, some other news not quite as happy as that is that Lois Slayton passed away Thursday and her service is going to be at 11 o'clock on Tuesday the 27th at Seaside um, I have another funeral to do at 10 o'clock in the morning of somebody that passed away and so I won't be doing it but uh, Reverend Kenny Ivan will be doing her service at uh, Seaside so those are the that's the information that I have. Let's uh, let's leave this place by holding hands and singing. We're one in the bond of love, as we get together, and go on and greet your families. Have a great time. Merry Christmas to them and you. Uh, have a great time. So here we go. We are one in the bond of love. We are one in the bond of love. We have joined our spirits with the Spirit of God. We are one in the bond of love.